Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this installment of the K Perpetua Speaker Series. Today, we will be learning about variability and recovery of sea star populations following wasting disease along Oregon coast and beyond. And we'll be hearing with, uh, from Melissa Miner. Uh, our next presentation for the speaker series is Saturday, March 5th. Um, we'll be hearing from Lisa Hildebrand on kelp to whales, evidence from a bottom up trophic cascade. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge that the Cape Perpetua area landscape from Yahats to Florence uh, is the traditional territory of the Siletz tribe and Coos, Lower Umpqua and Sayuslaw tribe and acknowledge the tribal governments and their roles historically and today in taking care of these lands. And you can learn, out, uh, learn more about these uh, tribes on their respective websites. A little bit about the Cape Perpetual Collaborative. My name is Tara Dubois, and I'm the communications coordinator for the collaborative. And it's a pleasure to host and um, organize this series. And our vision is to foster conservation and collaboration within local communities for scientific exchange, management, awareness, and stewardship from the land to the sea in and around the Cape Perpetual Marine Reserve. And our three guiding principles are community engagement, leveraging resources, and engaging in partnerships. And you can see along the bottom here, we have a variety of logos. Um, these are our founding partners uh, who came together in 2017 to um, pull the collaborative together. But in addition to these partners, I'd like to acknowledge that we have several uh, local partners and local businesses, local government, uh, local nonprofits, as well as many volunteers in the area. Um, and without everyone working together, we really couldn't um, fulfill our mission and do this great work. So thank you everyone to all of our partners. A uh, little bit about the Cape Perpetual Marine Reserve. Uh, this is our specialty, our, our specialty, our focus of the collaborative. Um, it's Oregon's largest marine reserve of five. Um, and in addition to the marine protected areas to the north and the south, uh, there's some form of protected waters that stretch between Yahats and Florence. Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife is the management agency of Oregon's marine reserves. And over to the right, you can see a variety of pictures that they have taken um, in their research uh, underwater, taken a deep dive underwater. You can learn more about Oregon's marine reserves at Cape, or, um, OregonMarineReserves.com. Uh, at, in the Cape Perpetua area, the collaborative also hosts a variety of community science projects. Um, you can see here, uh, there are several projects. Some of them are seasonal, um, but we also host monthly beach cleanups. And in addition to this speaker series, we host a young scientist webinar series on the second Tuesday of the month, October through April, where we focus on graduate students or postdocs on their ocean research. And another thing you can participate in year round is the Cape Perpetual BioBlitz series. If you've got the iNaturalist app, do connect with our project and anything, any observations you take in the area will upload automatically and will help us document biodiversity. And I have highlighted here our summer sea star surveys because today's topic is on sea stars. Um, and we do have a project page that shares a little bit more about the project at Yahat State Park that we do in the summer negative tide series. And I'll post a link to that um, in a bit that you can uh, learn more about if you'd like. Um, but you can find out information about all of our events um, and speakers coming up at our website, kperpetualcollaborative.org. And I also like to encourage folks to join us on our Facebook and our YouTube page. And if you like the work that we're doing, you could donate. Um, if you just go to our website, there's a donate button at the top. And if you just click on that, it'll take you through the steps. And with that, I'd like to introduce our speaker for the day, uh, Melissa Miner. Uh, she's a researcher at UC Santa Cruz. And for over 25 years, Melissa has played a key role in the collection of synthesis of long-term monitoring data from rocky intertidal communities ranging from Alaska to Mexico as part of the multi-agency Rocky Intertidal Network, also known as Marine. She is currently a researcher at UC Santa Cruz, but works remotely from Bellingham, Washington, where she lives with her family and fluffy rescue mutt, who have all assisted with Sea Star surveys. And with that, Melissa, I will go ahead and stop sharing, and you can um, pull up your presentation.
And while Melissa is pulling up her presentation, I'd just like to let the audience members know uh, that as questions come up throughout the presentation, feel free to add them to the chat box or the Q&A box. And we'll do a Q&A session after um, and address those questions. And it looks great, Melissa, from this end. Okay. Thanks, Tara, and um, thanks for that introduction. And thank you to everyone for tuning in on a Saturday morning. I don't know about down there, but up here, it's a, um, it's a beautiful sunny day, which is um, rare right this time of year. So <laughs> thanks. Thanks again for tuning in. Um, so as Tara mentioned, I'm going to talk to you about um, the status of sea star populations in Oregon, and then also talk more broadly about how they're doing along the, the whole West Coast. So before we get into sea stars, uh oh, advance worked earlier, and now of course it's not. Let's see. There we go. Um, so before I talk about sea stars, I just want to give a really brief introduction to the marine program. Um, and uh, this is a, a rocky intertidal monitoring program that's been going on in some cases for, um, for 40 years. And a project of this magnitude and this, this time scale wouldn't be possible without a lot of, of partners, a lot of um, contributors to this effort. And so I just wanted to acknowledge um, a lot of our contributors. This is not everybody listed here, but these are kind of some of the key players. And um, all of these groups either contribute through actual monitoring or contribution of funding or support um, by providing access. So a lot of different ways that organizations can contribute to this effort. So what we do with the um, with the marine monitoring is we target particular assemblages or species that are kind of the key players in the rocky intertidal system. And so some of them are pictured here. Um, and sea stars are, are one of those species. And I, I'm just going to go over the methods we use real quick um, for things like uh, mussels and rockweeds and barnacles, things that are um, fixed to the substrate. We use a percent cover method, and that's shown here. There's somebody sampling a mussel plot. Um, I think this is at our Fogarty Creek site. And we use this grid uh, with, hopefully you can see the, um, the lines on it that are strung. And what that gives us is 100 points. And under each of those points, we record what's under there. And these plots are in fixed locations. So we actually have bolts that are installed in the rock. So we can put these plots back in the same spot and follow trends over time. And then we do a similar thing for sea stars. But in this case, we're not getting percent cover. We're getting counts and sizes. So this gives us an idea of the population size and the size structure. And for these, we set up. Um, these irregularly shaped plots. These are again marked with bolts and then we stretch these meter tapes around the plots and that gives us a way to go back to exactly the same area every year and count and measure the sea stars in those those plots. So these data, this, um, this combination of percent cover and count data for sea stars and, and a number of other species, it gives us um, this long-term broad scale data that uses, and this is really important, standardized protocols. So all the way from Alaska to Mexico, we have data that are collected in exactly the same way. And that enables us to make comparisons among all of these various areas. And we can use the data to assess things like impacts from oil spills, um, We've used the data to design or help design marine protected areas and assess their effectiveness, look at changes from um, that are due to climate change. And then um, another thing that we've used the data for in, in several in instances is what I'll talk with you about today, and that's impacts from marine, marine disease events. Okay, so our data when we plot it out, so this is um, our southernmost site in Oregon, Burnt Hill, it's down um, near Brookings. Um, 
this is this is what the data look like and i'll walk you through this first graph i'm going to show you a few of these throughout this presentation so uh, this is year across the bottom so this particular site was established in 2002 on the y-axis we have counts so at this site this ranges from zero to 700 um, and so what this gives us is an idea of how the population has changed in size or in number over time. Um, these spots where I've got dotted lines, those are spots where we had to skip a year or two. So this is our, our COVID years in here. Um, and then some of these other areas are uh, times when we had funding lapses. But what you can see is numbers bounce around. Um, that's pretty normal for sea stars because they're highly, highly mobile species, even though when you see them at low tide, they look like they're just, um, you know, just standing still or, or stuck to the rock, but they move a lot when the water comes in. Um, but what you notice is there's this sharp decline here in 2015, and that was due to something called sea star wasting syndrome. And I'm sure most of you have heard about this disease. Um, but I'm going to tell you a little bit about it, what, what we know at this point, um, which honestly isn't a lot. Um, it's really a, a general description for a set of symptoms that have been seen in many species of sea stars and historically other echinoderms, so things like sea cucumbers. And we have seen, so this current event started in um, 2013, but we have seen prior events, mainly in Southern California, that were much smaller in scale. And um, all of those events were tightly tied to, to warm water. So typically, they were El Nino years, and we'd see um, sea stars or other echinoderms with lesions or, um, you know, dying um, during these periods of warm water, and then it would disappear when the water got cool. This current event that we're experiencing doesn't have that same tight link to temperature. So it seems like temperature anomalies are important in some areas. So for example, um, winter temperatures might be higher than normal, and that might be a time when we see um, increased prevalence of six stars in an area. But when we look at the coast-wide patterns of, of um, emergence of sea star wasting, there isn't a, an obvious link to temperature. So that's been kind of a curious piece of, of this disease puzzle. We know that there are at least 20 species of sea stars that are affected by the disease. Um, another kind of curious piece is that it doesn't seem to be um, density dependent. So oftentimes with diseases, if, uh, if the affected organism is tightly uh, packed together, so, so really densely um, found in really dense numbers, you'll see disease spread uh, more rapidly. And that's not the case with, with at least with ochre stars, um, which is the species that we have the best data for. Um, what we've seen instead is places like Oregon and the Washington coast, where really our highest ochre star numbers are found, the disease was was um, you know had a pretty major impact, but it was nowhere near as devastating as it was to populations further south, like Southern California, where in some areas we have no more ochre stars. So, um, and and then another um, so there's a lot of these kind of mysteries associated with this disease. And another piece that was kind of perplexing is that the spread. Um, initially, when, when we saw it, wasn't, um, it was really patchy. So the first place we documented it was on the Washington coast um, in June of 2013. And then one of the next places that we saw it was down in central California. And the Oregon coast actually wasn't affected until about a year after those first sightings. So there was... Um, the spread of it was not linear at all. So there are people who are looking into what the causes. I'm not one of those people. I'm an ecologist. So I look at the impacts of the disease on the organisms um, in terms of, of numbers and how that loss of numbers affects the, the greater intertidal community. 
Um, but there are people who are actually looking at what causes the disease. Um, one of the primary people is Ian Houston at Cornell, and he has been focusing on the microbiome. So looking at potential viruses and bacteria associated with six stars and how other factors like temperature and um, pH and oxygen might contribute to, um, to individuals developing this disease. And then I just wanna stress that this, this current sea star wasting epidemic that we've seen has persisted in the system since 2013. So we're going on nine years. And the big outbreak was really um, in 20, late 2013, 14, and even into early 2015. Since then, we have definitely seen um, a lessening of prevalence, but, but we still see um, kind of this low level of disease almost everywhere that we look. So it's, it's really common that you still see six stars out, um, out in intertidal sites and, and subtidal areas. Okay, so what does this look like? in the stars themselves. Um, and again, I'm gonna focus on ochre stars today, but this um, affects many different species. And I'm sure a lot of you have seen these, these stars if you've been out in, um, in the tide pools. So early signs include um, the stars being kind of lethargic. They can curl up their arms and just look kind of uncomfortable. This can be followed by the development of lesions and tissue decay. And then oftentimes stars will drop an arm or two or three. Um, and then if the disease progresses, you end up with a star that can look like this with lesions. And oftentimes they will have dropped um, several arms. Just because a star gets sick doesn't mean that it's, it's doomed to death. Uh, we do see stars with lesions that have healed. They're often kind of this orange color. And this will be hard tissue or um, firm tissue compared to where lesions are, which, um, which are kind of mushy and white. Um, as I mentioned, stars will drop arms. And so we see a lot of odd looking sea stars now with, um, with not the normal number of arms. So uh, this particular star has lost three arms and is growing back these little nubs. Um, it's common now to see sea stars that typically have five arms that now have six or seven or eight arms. So they'll grow back extra little nubs in the spot where they dropped one arm. Um, and uh, so I, I, wanna, um, I wanna show you some data next. Um, and I'm gonna, I'm actually gonna show you, uh, rather than kind of summarizing the Oregon coast, I wanna show you uh, the, the data from each of our five long-term monitoring sites, just in case you've got a, a favorite spot. Um, and so that you can kind of see some of the differences among these sites. So most of these sites were established in, um, in 2000 or around 2000. And um, as I mentioned earlier in the talk, Sea stars are just one of many species that we monitor. So if you're interested in looking at trends from other species at these sites, you can go to our website and I'll give this again at the end of the talk. Okay, so this is what, um, and I, I kind of walked through this earlier, but again, these are counts of sea stars on the y-axis and years across the bottom. And I'm starting up at our, um, our northernmost site, uh, Ecola State Park. And this is similar to the, the graph I showed earlier where we've got numbers kind of bouncing around and then the sharp decline due to sea star wasting. And then we've since seen pretty nice recovery at this site. And again, we've got some missing years in here, but our most recent survey showed that numbers were looking pretty good. If we move to the south a bit to Fogarty Creek, this is a site where there's lots of stars, really nice, healthy sea star population. Um, we've had some really big years, so this is probably on the order of 700 stars. And then again, sharp decline um, with the...
All right, so Melissa said she may have some internet issues and she, if that happened, she'd be right back in a couple minutes if she switches uh, to another computer. Um, so I think we'll just allow for a couple minutes uh, if you just wanna hold tight um, and she will be back. Um, but in the meantime, um, I can share with you a bit about, um, let me go here, the Sea Star survey that we do at Yahat State Park. Um, and you can see here, so we do the plot survey where we have a, oh, oh you're back, yay. Shoot. I was um, really hoping that wouldn't happen. Sorry about that. <laughs> So let me stop sharing, but this is the page where you can find out about uh, the surveys at Yahat State Park. And like I was just mentioning, we use the plot survey um, that Melissa shared earlier between the two different types um, where we go survey the same spot uh, every time we do it. All right, Melissa. I'll let okay, you hopefully that again. won't happen again. Sorry about that. <laughs> We've been having some, some trouble with, um, with the internet here, so. Um, now is it reversed? I'm not seeing your presentation. You're not seeing it? Okay. Let me, let's see. Uh, oops. Sorry about that. Okay. Cancel. Share screen. Here we go. Gotta love technology. <laughs> it's beautiful until it isn't, right? <laughs> it's it's frustrating too because we've been doing this for so long, and you <laughs> think that we would have it dialed in. <laughs> All right, take it over again, Melissa. <laughs> okay, we can see and now yes. you can see the the full slide. Okay. Yep. Uh, oops, sorry. A little a few issues at my end. Okay, so I think we're, did you hear me talk about Bob Creek or did I lose you right before then? I don't think we heard you. Uh, okay. I don't recall Bob Creek. Uh, okay. It was at the end of Fogarty Creek, I believe. Okay. No, the Cannon Beach location. All right, so, um, so Bob Creek is within the Cape Perpetua Reserve. And um, this is a, um, Another site where we've had pretty steady numbers of sea stars, there was a slight decline there um, associated with sea star wasting. And since then, we've actually had um, really a, a kind of explosion of sea stars at this site. Um, so really, really big numbers. And um, they've since tapered off a little bit, but still even more than, than we were seeing um, prior to the disease event. Okay, and then um, Cape Arago is our site uh, to the south, our, our southernmost site. And um, sorry about this. I'm gonna move this over if I can. Oh, all right. I'm just, I'm gonna look a little funny because my presentation's on my big screen, but um, just listen to me talk, don't look at. <laughs> Don't look at the fact I'm not looking at you. Um, okay, so Cape Arago is another, our, our site um, down by Coos Bay. This is a site where we have had um, pretty good, we had pretty large numbers prior to the event. And then we actually had a decline um, prior to sea star wasting. Um, and so we had a slight decline associated with uh, stars being sick. Uh, but again, there was a decline prior to the disease, so we can't attribute this big loss entirely to sea star wasting. Um, but then we've since seen some recovery. And then our southernmost site, Burnt Hill, um, down by Brookings, this was a site that had um, a large number of stars. We had a big loss associated with sea star wasting. And we haven't really seen the recovery that we've seen at the other sites. So just to summarize that, since I, I know I lost you in the middle, um, four of our five sites seem like they're doing pretty well in terms of numbers, but then our southernmost site still got a ways to go in terms of population recovery. 
Okay, and then um, I know Tara showed uh, the data from Yahats, but I just wanted to acknowledge um, three of the community groups that we're working with in Oregon. So when um, this epidemic started, we realized that there were a lot of areas where um, we didn't have any data really for, for sea stars. And this is particularly true up where I am in Washington. So we had great um, coverage on the outer coast, but where I am in the Salish Sea, Puget Sound region, there were a lot of sea star habitats where we knew nothing about the populations. And so we partnered with a number of community groups who were interested in collecting the same type of data that we collect with marine, so those count size um, data. And so there are three sites um, that we have nice, um, fairly long-term data at this point. And then there are three, I think it's three additional groups in Oregon where either we haven't received um, current data for, for a little while, or we don't quite have long enough data to show you. Um, but I just wanted to acknowledge their work as well. So real quick, this is what the trends look like for those three areas. This is Haystack Rock. Um, Roads End, which is sampled um, by the Nature Conservancy and lots of volunteers. And then at Yahats Beach, uh, the Cape Perpetua Collaborative now samples and, um, and organizes monitoring for this site, but it was initially set up by the Coast Watch Group. And you can see that for all of these, numbers start out low and then um, climb over time. And this is because they were all established at that kind of low point following that, that sea star decline. And so what that means is it's harder at these areas to know um, when, they, uh, when they have fully recovered because we don't know what the normal condition is at those sites. Um, but by having those all those other sites with that longer term data, we can kind of use those to, um, to help us assess recovery in these areas. Okay, so I wanna blow it up now. Um, we've been focusing on Oregon, but I wanna show you what we've seen along the entire West Coast. So there's a lot packed into this. Um, it's called a heat map. Um, and so I'm gonna walk you through it slowly. Um, what, what we have here is every single site where we sample um, sea stars along the West Coast. And that goes all the way from Alaska down to Southern California. And um, the data for these sites is represented by boxes. So each of these boxes represents a year's sea star count, basically. And the color of the box represents the, um, the population size relative to the long-term mean. So these colors that are kind of purpley, blue, white, those are, those are good. So those are areas where either the population is um, higher than normal or, um, or right about at that, that normal level. Anything in red represents a decline. Um, and the darker the red, the, the bigger the decline. And so what you see in this pre sea star wasting period is that most of the colors for all of these sites are, um, are in that blue to white um, hue. And as we move across, so this begins in 2000 and goes up to this line here in 2013, and that's when we saw the disease hit. Um, so to the right of this line, everything for the most part is red, at least initially. And that means that, that we saw massive decline at these sites. Um, when we look up in Northern California and Oregon, we see that the, the boxes start to turn this white or, or blue color, at, at least at some of the sites. And so that's showing us that these areas are starting to recover. We don't see that in Southern California. For the most part, everything's red. We've got some missing um, survey data here, but in general, things are looking pretty bad up here. They're looking better to the north, but as you can see, there's still areas um, that, that have not experienced much recovery at all. Okay, so how do we get recovery? Um, 
In case you don't know, ochre stars, along with many other species of sea stars, are what are called broadcast spawners. So what that means is they release their gametes into the water, and if an egg is fertilized, then it grows up into an em embryo and then a larval sea star, which floats around in the water column for typically a few weeks. And then when it gets to a place um, both where it's ready to settle and it seems like it's a, um, a suitable habitat for it, it will qu quickly um, metamorphose into something that looks like the, the sea stars that, that we know from the shore. Um, and so th the other piece to the story, I've, I've shown you count data so far, the other piece is the size structure of the population. So even though these numbers, and this is Bob Creek, um, are in some cases higher than they were prior to the sea star wasting event. What we're not seeing yet is recovery of the size structure. So um, this is another um, graph that I'll walk you through. So this time we're starting with, uh, I had to cut off the top of the graph, but this is 2004 here going down to 2021. And these bubbles represent the number of stars that are in a particular size class. So the bigger the bubble, the more the stars. These I've kind of drawn a schematic down here of, of star size. And um, so these are, these are the little bitty guys at this end. And then these are the really big ones on the, on the right side of the graph. So um, when we, uh, when we look at the, the earlier years, this is kind of what the normal size structure looks like for a population. So we've got a nice distribution of stars of different sizes across the, the whole population. When we look at more recent years, most of the stars are in this smaller size class. And what that means is that the, the population, um, it doesn't have the same uh, impact on the, the community as these larger stars have. So these, these big stars, they produce more babies, they eat more, more and different types of food. And um, so this is, this is an important piece. And it's something that at, um, at all of the, the organ sites and pretty much everywhere, we haven't seen this recovery to a normal size distribution. Okay, so um, I'm going to blow it up again and show you what recruitment patterns look like along the entire West Coast. So again, we're going from Alaska down to Southern California, Oregon's in here. And this time, the darker the color, the better it is. So these are just numbers of juveniles. And you can see in Northern California and Oregon, we've got some areas that are seeing really high recruitment levels. Um, I do want to point out that even within Oregon and, and Northern California, some of our, our places that are doing best in terms of recovery, there are sites where we're not seeing um, those high recruitment numbers. And then the other thing um, to point out is that uh, south of this line here, so this is Point Con Conception, which is a uh, an important biogeographic barrier in California where the, the coast turns inland and things um, tend to be quite different north and south of this point. Um, you can see that we have seen virtually no recruitment at those Southern California sites. So what that means is that the, the current outlook for sea star populations in that area is, is pretty poor. Okay, so why do we care about um, sea stars and, and ochre stars in particular? Um, well, one of the big reasons is that they are uh, kind of the, the most charismatic members of tide pool and near shore communities. They're just a species that, that people love. They're sort of the, the ambassadors for the, um, for the rocky intertidal shoreline. And we actually got a lot of people who were really concerned and, you know, almost in tears calling us up when, when the uh, sea star wasting was kind of at its, at its high point and people were seeing these, these melting stars on the shore. So they're, they're kind of important that way because they're a, a connection for people to this important marine habitat. The reason that 
ecologists are really interested in ochre stars. It's that they they were the the species that helped us define this concept of a keystone predator. So this idea was developed by a researcher named Bob Payne up in Washington on um, Tatouche Island. And what he did was he um, he had areas where he had sea stars and mussels, and um, he removed them. And what he saw is that when he removed these sea stars, the mussels moved down in the intertidal. So they moved lower toward the water. And so um, what, what that means is that these sea stars in that particular area were, um, were helping to shape the rocky intertidal community by providing space for th through predation, so through eating mussels, they would free up space on the rock for other organisms like red algae, and chitons, and barnacles, and all kinds of other things. And so um, in his studies, he concluded that, um, that these, these ochre stars, these keystone predators, were important for maintaining um, higher biodiversity in terms of the species that attach to the rock. So mussels themselves can support a lot of different species. Um, so, so when we talk about increased biodiversity, we're really talking about the things that need that space on the rock. Um, so this, this sea star wasting disease gave us this, um, this opportunity, which is kind of the silver lining of, of this pretty horrible event, um, but it gave us this opportunity to test this really important and really controversial hypothesis because some people felt like it didn't apply everywhere and it hadn't been tested in that many different types of, of um, rocky or tidal environments. Um, but anyway, the disease gave us a, an opportunity to test this idea at a very large scale, um, the scale that, that wouldn't have been ethical. You know, we wouldn't have wanted to remove sea stars from as many places as the disease did. Okay, so what did we find? I'm going to show you some pictures first because sometimes that's more fun than looking at um, graphs of data. So this is one of our sites in Monterey down in California. And um, what I've done here is draw where the lower edge of the mussel bed was in spring 2014. So this, this orange line here outlines the, the lower edge of the mussel bed. This was a site where we lost a large number of ochre stars. And just a year later, so this is in spring 2015 now, that line has dropped substantially. So mussels moved down toward the water um, because the sea stars weren't there, or this is, this is the hypothesis that the sea stars weren't there kind of controlling that, that lower edge. Okay, so what do we see when we look at this idea on a broad scale? Um, so this, this graph here represents the tidal height of that lower limit of mussels. So this is higher in the intertidal, this is lower. This is pre-sea star wasting. So these are the years 2000 to 2015. And you can see that lower edge was pretty stable across this, this really broad geographic area. And then after sea star wasting, um, led to the loss of a lot of ochre stars, we saw this rapid drop, again, across this very broad um, geographic area. If we look at what we saw in Oregon, and these are data from Sarah Gravum at OSU that she shared with me yesterday, um, each of these colored lines represents a site where she's been looking at that lower limit of mussels um, at a number of Oregon sites. And this is years since sea star wasting hit. So what she found is that that lower limit at some of these sites dropped some. You can see this, this purple site here, there was a, a bit of a drop, but for the most part, it's been pretty um, stable. So, um, so in terms of lower limit, maybe a, a slight decline. But the interesting bit is that there was a big change, at least at some sites, in the percent cover of mussels. So um, the actual number of mussels that were packed into that same 
area. And what that looks like here is there's, you know, patches of mussels with um, maybe rock or other organisms that are living in these patches. And then <clears throat> just a few years after those sea star numbers declined, those mussels really filled in those, those open spaces. But now we've come back to a place where we've got this more patchy condition again. So um, again, this is something that Sarah is still working on and still sort of in the preliminary stages, but really interesting um, results. Okay, so I wanna make sure that we have lots of time for questions, I, but I do wanna touch on one more species and that's the sunflower star because it's, it's a really, the ochre stars are, um, you know, a, a keystone predator in terms of controlling um, or potentially controlling things in the, the rocking or tidal habitat. Sunflower stars are like ochre stars on steroids. Everything is afraid of these guys. They eat everything. And what that means is they really have a big influence on their, um, their surrounding habitat. But these guys were some of the hardest hit, I'd, I'd, I'd say the hardest um, impacted or most heavily impacted species by sea star wasting. So um, their numbers declined so much that um, a group at OSU and the Nature Conservancy put together a, um, a application to have them listed by um, the IUCN Red List, which is an, an international listing as critically endangered. And they're now a um, possible candidate for the U.S. endangered species list. That's that's currently underway. And um, this is what um, the OSU and Nature Conservancy Group, this is what they were basing their, um, their uh, listing on. Um, so these blue bars are showing uh, densities of sunflower stars prior to sea star wasting. These red bars are kind of during those, those years when sea star wasting is occurring. And then the, um, the green bars show what the population looks like now. Um, so it's, it's declined in excess of, of 97%, and that's coastwide. The decline has been particularly bad in the southern part of its range. So from Oregon to, um, to California. Um, so again, why do we care so much? Um, I mentioned that sunflower stars eat lots of things. One of the things that they eat are urchins and urchins eat kelp. And um, so what we see in some areas where sunflower stars have disappeared is the urchins have become much more abundant and their behavior has, has changed. So they're not afraid anymore because one of their major predators isn't around. And so they can eat all of the kelp and we end up with these areas called urchin barrens where it's basically just urchins and um, crustose coral and algae. And once a, an area gets to this stage, it's, it's really hard to recover. Um, because you just don't don't have the kelp around anymore to kind of repopulate that 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 area. So um, this has become a big concern. This isn't happening everywhere that sunflower stars have disappeared. And there are other factors like warm water events and low oxygen. And so it's kind of a it's a more complex story than just the loss of sunflower stars, but they are definitely a key piece of the story. Um, so just in summary, I know I, I covered a lot of things today, um, but uh, sea star wasting has clearly had a major impact on ochre star populations along the entire range, um, all the way from, from Alaska to Southern California. Uh, the, those su that Southern part of the population is, is really um, having a hard time recovering from this event. But the good news is in places like Oregon and Northern California, those populations are trending toward recovery. But again, we haven't seen that, that full recovery of the, um, the size structure. And because the disease is still present, there's still a lot of uncertainty about um, you know, 
the, the sort of the long-term um, recovery estimates. The cause of the disease is still unknown, which makes it really um, tricky. We can't actually go out and say for sure that sea star wasting is at a place because there's, there's nothing to test for. Um, covered this third point already, the, um, the community change, which I had talked about, that predicted um, expansion of muscle beds, that's been observed in some areas where opal stars have declined, but not everywhere, and that, that includes many areas in Oregon. Um, and then finally, the sunflower star populations are still very severely depressed, particularly in the southern part of their range. And I want to end with um, a way that you can help us to track uh, sunflower stars and other species of stars. So we have a bunch of online resources on our website, seastarwasting.org, um, or you can go to our larger website where you can see all of the, the different species, pacificrockhangertitle.org. And one of the things you can do is um, submit what's called a sea star observation log. And um, what this is, is a way, if you go out to the tide pools or your favorite intertidal site and you see um, any number of species of sea stars, you can record that information and let us know whether they were healthy or sick. Um, and it really, it takes a little bit of investment. You, what we need from you is, um, you know, kind of basic information, the date and the site name. We need site location. Um, so that would need to be in, um, in the, the GPS coordinates, but you can get that from Google Maps. And then we also ask that people use the Latin names for identifying sea stars. And this is because there are, um, for some species, there are multiple common names, and so it can get confusing. But we have really nice guides on our website, and there are other, you know, sources of really great sources of information for um, for learning how to identify sea stars. And we're always happy to help people if you want to take a picture, if you're not sure about a species, or if you're not sure if a star is sick or healthy, you can send us a, a photo, and we can help you try and figure out what it is and, and whether it looks healthy. Um, but this helps a lot for tracking where people are seeing various species of sea stars. Again, particularly important for sunflower stars. There's a lot of interest in that one right now. Um, and then if you do this, you get to become mildly famous. You'll get um, one of these pins on our, our sea star tracking map, we call it. Um, so this is the information for the site at Yahat Beach. And this is the, the observations, not the, the long-term data that, um, that I showed you earlier, um, although that does get wrapped into here as well. Uh, but you can see here all the names of, um, of all the people who have submitted observations for this site are included here. And um, so you get information about when the disease was first observed. And then if you go to the site observation history, That'll give you all the species that have been seen and whether or not um, they were sick or healthy on a given date. Okay, so that's all I have for you. I apologize for losing you in the middle. Um, and I think we still have time for questions, right? Yes, definitely. Okay. <laughs> and we've had some great ones roll in. Um, I always like to kick off the Q&A session with one of my own, I'm always curious to know, uh, was there an aha moment for you, an experience, um, or what was the inspiration behind kind of going into this field for you? Oh, going into marine biology? Um, yeah, and for kind of me, studying it's, sea stars a bit deeper. Yeah, it's just always been a passion for me from, I, I grew up in the Bay Area and um, spent a lot of time at the beach in Santa Cruz. And um, it's just, it's always been something I loved. So it, it, there wasn't a, I guess, you know, kind of a key moment for me was when I realized that I could actually do this as a career. Um, and that was from a, a high school teacher that I had um, for biology, um, just learning that she was, she was a scientist and this is what she, she did for a living. I, I just, I hadn't put those two pieces together. Um, but yeah, I, I think it just was always always something I loved and I've had some really great mentors along the way. 
And there is something about sea stars that folks just gravitate to in those tide pools. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're a great way to get that conversation started about the whole ecosystem there. Yeah. Um, so I'll start uh, getting to the questions now. So how long do sea stars typically live? And did the 2020 year heat wave affect sea stars? Yeah, so those are good questions with hard answers. <laughs> not, <laughs> not, not, um, I, I don't have um, nice clean answers for you. So um, it really varies by species of sea star. And I think it's, it's also, you know, some species we can kind of more easily track um, how they grow so we can track their growth through time because we can tag them and come back for the same individuals. Sea stars are really tricky to, to tag. So they, they will just, um, if you try and tag them with something, they'll just shed that tag pretty quickly. And so there's that, that's been one of the, the tricky things about a, making recovery assessments um, for various species for this disease, because we really don't have great growth information for, for any of these species. Um, and so I guess that's another potential silver lining for this event is we had, we lost so many stars from some areas that when we got those recruitment events, we can now follow those through time and make better growth estimates. So I would say in general, they, for ochre stars, they grow quicker than, than we thought they did. Um, individuals that are maybe, uh, I don't know, like a street taco size, they, <laughs> they are just a couple years old where I think in the past people may have thought that it took a lot longer for them to get to that size. Um, but yeah, we're still kind of learning about um, growth rates. And in terms of the, the warm water event, so in, um, I, again, th there hasn't been this this nice correlation with um, emergence of disease and warm water. There are definitely places where it seems like it fits nicely. And then there are other places where it's it's not as, as nice of a fit. And so it's been kind of perplexing actually. So sorry, I don't have great answers <laughs> for you. <laughs> That's okay. And there's always more questions to be answered too uh, <laughs> when you're doing research, I've learned. Um, do you, and, and again, if you don't know the answer to all of these, that's okay. Um, do you know what the impact immediate and ongoing of sea star wasting on bull kelp forests? Yeah, so, um, so this is, this is, and I touched on this a little bit with the sunflower stars mm -hmm. where the loss of sunflower stars has definitely been an important piece um, in terms of this decline in not just the bull kelp, but but all the kelps kind of coast wide, but it's it's just a piece of the story. And I think um, I personally am not a subtitle researcher, and um, so I'm sure there are folks who can who can give you a better answer on this than I can. But there are other um, really important pieces that have kind of factored into that. So warm water in some places. It looks like we may have lost her again. Um, and if we can't get her back in the next minute or so, what I will do is pull these questions um, and send them to her. And what I can do is make sure an email goes out to everybody. We have one already with the recording link um, and we can address these questions because you, the audience has some really great questions. Um, and we can address these when we post the recording um, to our blog and to our YouTube channel. So we will get some answers or maybe some links where you can learn more information. So sorry about the technical difficulties today. I am glad we got through the presentation. Um, let's see if she's back. There you are. So oh, sorry. That's uh, okay. I really... Well, we just had a couple more minutes, so there's no point in me plugging into the, the hardwire. But <laughs> anyway, just to make just to give time for a couple more questions. The the story is complex. Um, 
but that but loss of stars is is part of it because they do at least some species of sea stars are really important for controlling those predators on the kelps. And then do you know uh, what the predator, who are the predators of sea stars? Um, so it, it, again, it depends on the species um, because sea stars, they kind of get lumped together, but they there are um, sea stars that are predators on other sea stars. There are sea stars that are only herbivores. There's sea stars like the ochre star that eat mussels and whelks and all kinds of things. Um, in terms of ochre stars, the one that I focused on mostly today, there aren't a whole lot of predators. You'll see um, the occasional gull that's trying to shove one down its throat, which I, I don't understand. I don't, I don't see how it could possibly be worth the effort of trying to eat it. But um, when they were little, we actually were sent a number of pictures from people where they could, there were gulls just kind of gulping down that smaller size. Um, but yeah, in general, most species of sea stars don't have a lot of predators. Okay. And do you notice any difference of sea star wasting and ochre stars of uh, different colors, uh, say between orange and purple, or by their size, small and larger? So definitely not by size. All the sizes are affected equally, I'd say. Um, I know that Bruce Mangy at Oregon State, he, I, I hope I don't get this wrong, but I'm pretty sure early on, he was seeing some evidence that the, the orange coloration might be more heavily impacted than the other colors. But then I feel like that may have been walked back a bit. So um, potentially a, an association with color, um, but, but I'm not certain about that. And then let's see here. Oh, do you have the site um, for the sunflower star endangered species? Is there a public comment where folks can go to give a public comment? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I don't have it. That's something I can send to you, Tara, if okay. you can send it out to people. I can. Um, but you could also go, I think if you just go to, if you just did a search for um, endangered species and Pycnopodia, I'm guessing you could find it, but but yeah, I can find that and send that to you. Okay. Um, water temperature and de disease are major factors. Where are there were there any unusual ocean events in 2014, underwater volca volcanoes, or increase in earthquakes uh, that could have potentially impacted these areas? Yeah, there was nothing that could have been at that that broad scale where you're seeing the entire coast. You know, one of the things that we got um, the most um, the the most questions about from you know from people who were concerned about the sea stars was Fukushima, because that wasn't too long after the the expectation of of radiation would be reaching our shores. Um, but there were there was a group at um, Berkeley who was tracking that that movement of the radiation um, through uh, they were they were taking kelp samples and, and looking at radiation levels. And it actually didn't reach our shores until after we started seeing sea stars decline. So, um, yeah, that that was discredited. So that's the only thing that, you know, potentially could have affected that that really broad area. But yeah, it, it's been one of the frust most frustrating things is there doesn't seem to be a single smoking gun, a, a one thing that, that correlates with that, um, that really broad decline that we saw coastwide. And what is the relationship between long-term data and the observation data? Yeah, so those are useful for different things. So the long-term data, um, as I talked about, helps us to assess uh, recovery of populations um, from a disease event like this because we know what, what falls within the realm of normal because we have all those, you know, normal years. Um, the observation data are really great because it gives us information um, that's spatially much more um, 
complete because people can go anywhere and submit mm -hmm. observations. And then also temporally. So our, our long-term data are great because we've been collecting them since um, 2000. So we've got, you know, over 20 years of data along the Oregon coast, but we only go back each summer. So it's just once a year. And that doesn't help that much for, um, for looking at patterns of disease emergence. Uh, so those observation data have actually been used by a number of researchers to try and look for relationships between things like temperature and, um, you know, distance to uh, to nearest cities to look at maybe um, mm. potential human influ influence on the disease emergence, all these different things that our long term data just don't do a good job of because we don't have that that frequent um, time scale. Mm -hmm. So they're really kind of different. They allow us to answer different types of questions. Um, and then do you know how uh, deep typically the sunflower star, um, you know, goes or where does it remain mostly? Because you often don't see them in the intertidal area. Yeah, so they are rare in the intertidal. And that's one of the reasons it's not a focal species for our long-term monitoring surveys. Mm -hmm. We will definitely record them if we see them. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, they do tend to be rare in the intertidal. Uh, some encouraging news is a few, what was it, maybe two months ago, we got um, some observations through our observation log from somebody um, in the Mendocino area, so in Northern California, who saw three kind of medium sized um, sunflower stars that were healthy in the intertidal. It was a really mm -hmm. low tide, but still that was really encouraging. Yeah. Um, in terms of their depth, I'm not going to give you a number because I'll probably get it wrong, but it's <laughs> they go pretty deep. But the crazy thing is there's another species that looks really similar to Pycnopodia called Rathbanaster. And that kind of picks up, they, they sort of meet, they overlap at that really deep depth. And then the Rathbanaster goes even deeper. And so that can be tricky. You know, the, the data for those deeper surveys are, um, they're all from submersible or ROV. And so you have to be really careful that you're not confusing those two. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that was one of the thoughts early on is that maybe there was a depth refuge because the water stays cooler at those, those um, lower depths. And in prior events where it was that really nice, um, there was that really nice connection with temperature, there, there were, um, depth refuges. So when um, when divers would go down deeper, they'd see that all the sea stars were healthy at those deeper depths. That's not been the case with this one. We've observed six stars all the way down to their, their deepest depths. Very cool. Um, now, I don't know the acronym of this one, so I'm hoping that you will. And if not, hopefully Rebecca will uh, chime in here on, in the chat. Are sea stars affected by HABs in any way? Oh yeah, um, harmful algal, uh, algal blooms. Okay, right. Um, <laughs> I don't know the answer to that. And I think it's something that people have, um, you know, they, they have looked at some for this, this recent wasting event to see if there was some connection. Um, but again, that gets tricky because there are other factors that that influence when we see harmful algal, algal blooms that might also, you know, be stressors for sea stars. So um, I, I don't know the answer to that one. Mm -hmm. And last question, we have a couple on this one. Is the sea star wasting a global issue? Are we seeing it in other countries like in Japan or even, you know, uh, on the uh, coast, coastlines of the Atlantic Ocean? Yeah, that's a good question. So again, I want to stress that because we don't know what the cause is, we can't say that this, okay. this thing that we're seeing on the West Coast is occurring elsewhere. Um, sea stars, you know, they don't have a lot of ways of expressing stress. And so these lesions and tissue degradation that we see, that could be caused by any number of things. Um, we definitely see stars globally with symptoms that are similar to, to what we're seeing on the West Coast. 
Um, there wasn't anything that was perfectly timed with the event that, that we were seeing at the same time in terms of when it was really, when we were seeing that, that, that high mortality. Um, but yeah, on the East Coast, they, they have had kind of this cyclical emergence of, of a wasting disease. And um, I know in Australia, Japan, you know, they've had similar events. But again, we don't know if it's all caused by the same thing or if these are all, you know, unrelated. Mm -hmm. um, the cause is unrelated. It's just the symptoms are the same. Mm -hmm. It really is a fascinating topic. Um, and it's amazing how many folks have questions around it. So thank you so much for coming and sharing all the information that you do have. It was such a pleasure to chat face to face with you and have this presentation because we've done so much by email around the surveys. So uh, yeah. this is really great. Um, and I, I see on the list, we've got some volunteers who do the survey who attended today too. So again, thank you so much, Melissa, for joining us. Thank you to the audience members for chiming in today. Um, really great questions. Always appreciate your questions. And with that, I hope you all have a wonderful weekend. Um, and see you at a future presentation. Thanks, Sarah. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.